Hello fellow scholars. Welcome back to the Ripe Good Scholar YouTube channel. My name is Sarah. Today we're going to be working through the final act of A Midsummer Night's Dream. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves what happened in Act 4. Oberon and Titania made up, and Bottom's head was put right. Theseus found the Athenian lovers all in love with the correct people. He decided they should all just get married right now, so they did. <laughs> the Mechanicals were sad that they wouldn't get to perform, but Bottom talked them into heading to court anyway. And that is where we will get started with Act 5. Theseus and Hippolyta wonder about the lovers and the strange things they have seen. Theseus writes it off as love making one mad. A madman sees devils and fearful things, but a lover sees beauty and fanciful things. They are one and the same. More strange than true, I never may believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell could hold. That is, the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination, that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? The lovers enter, all happily married, and Theseus calls forth his master of revels, Philostrate. Philostrate presents the duke with a list of items they could be entertained by. The first is a song, but the duke doesn't want to hear it. The next is a scene he has already seen, <laughs> so he doesn't want to see that performed. The satire doesn't seem fitting to a wedding celebration. The last option is Pyramus and Thisbe, the tragedy of two lovers, much more fitting for a wedding celebration. Theseus wants to see that because of the very contradictory description provided by Philostrate. He says it's terrible and the Duke probably doesn't want to see it. Theseus insists and Philostrate goes to fetch the players. A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For in all the play there is not one word apt, one player fitted, and tragical, my noble lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. Hippolyta isn't so sure about this decision, but Theseus ensures her that it will be hilarious. You see, they can make fun of the players. He does it all the time when people get flustered talking to him. The kinder we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake and what poor duty cannot do. Noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have purposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes, where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practiced accent in their fears, and in conclusion dumbly have broke off, not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, out of this silence I yet picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty I read as much as from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. 
love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in the least speak most to my capacity. And the play is a doozy. First, the prologue sums up the entire play. Gentles, perchance you wonder at the show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbe, is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink poor souls they are content to whisper, at the witch let no man wonder, this man with lanthorn dog and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine, for if you will know by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninus's tomb, there, there to woo, this grisly beast which lie in height by name, the trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright, and as she fled her mantle did she fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereabout with blade, with bloody blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast, and Thisbe tearing in mulberry shade his dagger drew and died for all the rest let lion moonshine wall and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain stout who is portraying the wall makes sure to explain what he is in this same interlude it doth befall that i one snout by name present a wall and such a wall as I would think, that had in it a crannied hole or chink, through which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did whisper often secretly. This loam, this rough cast, and this stone, doth show that I am that same wall, and truth is so, and this the cranny is, right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that I ever heard discourse, my lord. Pyramus and Thisbe begin their scene with frequent comments from the lovers in the peanut gallery. The wall leaves and the lion enters to explain his role. Now is the mural down between the two neighbors. No remedy, my lord, when walls are such willful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in this kind are but shadows. The worst are no worse if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination then and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in, a man and a lion. You ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear, the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor, may now perchance both quake and tremble here, when lion rough and wild as rage doth roar. Then know that I, one snug the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should as lion come in strife into this place, twere pity on my life. A gentle beast of a good conscience. The moon makes sure to explain the lantern he holds is supposed to represent the moon. He mispronounces lantern as lanthorn, so the audience has a field day with horn puns. It gets dirty. The tragic play ends and Theseus stops them from doing an epilogue and everyone goes to bed. No epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when the players are all dead, there needs none to be blamed, Mary. If he that writ it had played Pyramus and hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy. And so it is, truly, and very notably discharged. But come to your Bergamask and let your epilogue alone. The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve lovers to bed. Tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn as much as we this night have overwatched. This palpable gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight hold we this solemnity in nightly revels and new gelidity. Puck returns to prepare the space for the fairy king and queen. Oberon and Titania call forth their fairies and celebrate in song, getting that dancing.
Puck delivers the final soliloquy to the audience, asking forgiveness for any offense, and tells the audience to pretend this was all but a dream. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear. And this week an idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And, as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. And that's it for A Midsummer Night's Dream. I hope you all enjoyed this series, and I encourage you to continue exploring Shakespeare and A Midsummer Night's Dream. Find a local production or a film, read it, or listen to an audio play. It's really worth encountering these plays multiple times if you're up for it. Next time, we're going to talk about some of the themes that we saw in A Midsummer Night's Dream. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure to hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss that video. For more Shakespeare fun in the meantime, check out my blog at ripegoodscholar.com or my podcast Breaking Bard. Links down below to those and all other social media. See you next time. And remember, go wisely and go slowly. Those who rush, stumble, and fall.